Welcome to the Canadian edition of the Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Thank you, Andrew, for everything you've done, for the teachings that you do. It has affected every area of our life, my wife, our marriage, our kids, our business. So I just want to say thank you to you. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm now nearing the end of my third week teaching on the authority of the believer, and I've covered a lot of material. The first two weeks, I was just talking about where authority comes from, that God gave authority to mankind. When mankind yielded to the devil, we're the ones who made Satan. We empowered him with the authority that God gave us over this earth. And since Satan is a spiritual being, he has to have our consent and cooperation in order to do anything in this earth. This also explains why Jesus had to become a man because he is, God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and he gave authority over this earth to people with physical human bodies. And so Jesus had to become a man to take back the authority that we had surrendered to the devil. Then he gave that power to us. And what I've been doing this week is showing that even though we have power and authority over all sickness, over all disease, and over all demons to cast them out, even though we've got that authority, there are limitations, restrictions to how you use it. Because even in uh, Jesus' life, in Mark chapter 6, He could do no mighty work in His hometown because of their unbelief, not His unbelief. He had all authority in and power, but he wouldn't use it against a person free will. If people chose to reject him, that limited what he could do. You could say he couldn't do it, or you could say he wouldn't do it. He will not violate people's free will. So I've been talking about that and giving examples of that this week, because if you don't understand that, you could take what I've been teaching about God giving us authority, like Matthew chapter 10, where it says he gave us authority over all demons to cast them out, over all sickness, and to heal all diseases. And then he told us to go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He told us to do those things. And if you aren't careful, you'll go out and just think, it's just up to me. If I believe, I can make these things happen. But you don't have authority over people's will. And Satan can affect you. You know, this has many applications. I've been talking about healing a lot, but it also has applications in the area of finances. And I had to learn this too, because when I first started in ministry, I thought that if I was just trusting God and believing God, and if my faith was where it should be, then God would just supernaturally supply my needs. I didn't understand that He did it through people. You know, Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. God supplies financial needs through people. God doesn't have the U.S. currency or whatever country you're watching this in. He doesn't have currency. He doesn't have money in heaven, and He's not going to counterfeit currency. That's not how it happens. God supplies our needs through people. And if you have a business, say for instance, you're working for somebody, well then God is going to supply your needs through that business and how it prospers. If you own your own business and you're selling a product, whether it's a service or a product that you're selling, God's not going to buy your product. He's going to use people. And so you can sit there and take your authority and say, I command my finances to come but God's not going to meet it directly. He's going to flow through people. And if people are operating in fear, if, you know, just all kinds of things can happen. Like you have a recession and all of the news starts talking about everybody. You better plan for lack and, and uh, it's going to be terrible. And if they're doing this, this will affect people and it will affect them buying your product, using your service. If you're a minister, it will affect the way that they give to you. And you, you have to take those things into account. You know, I remember when Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker, I can't remember the exact time, but it was a long time ago. I think it was probably back in the 80s or something like that. Both of them had scandals. And uh, because of it, people lost faith in media ministries. 
And in that, at that time, I was only on um, radio. But did you know that my income dropped $40,000 a month because of what other people did? I had nothing to do with it. It wasn't my lack of integrity. I didn't do anything wrong, but people all of a sudden had their faith in media ministry shaken. The actual church that I was going to in Colorado Springs, the pastor of the church, it was a mega church. He got up and he said, this is why you should never give directly to any media ministry. You just ought to give to the local church and trust the local church to give to all of these other ministries and that way they can vet it for you and make sure that you only put your money in, in positive places. Boy, that is the wrong thing for on so many levels. For one thing, uh, there are thousands, tens of thousands of Christian nonprofit ministries and it's impossible to think that one church could sit there and know all of these and supply, uh, you know, all of the resources to these ministries that need to happen. Plus, even if they could do that, it wouldn't be teaching the individual to be led by God in their giving. Basically, the scripture says you're supposed to give where you're fed. And I could get off and spend a lot of time talking about this, but see, it, people need to learn how to respond to the Lord. They don't need to just, you know, turn their money over and let somebody else disperse it. You need to listen to God and how you're supposed to give. But, but my point is, see that when those two media ministries were exposed as doing something wrong, well, then people quit giving. And my finances were affected, not because I did anything wrong, but because God uses people. I've also learned that like when 9-11 happened, any time that a national crisis happens, Christians are like 9-11 especially, everybody didn't know where this was going. They didn't know if that was just the first step and if, you know, we were going to have uh, some type of invasion or terrible terrorist things. And, and because of it, people were uh, watching the secular news. They turned off Christian television and they were just glued to the news watching what was going on. I'm not criticizing that. I also watched and wondered about where this was going. But I'm saying that when any type of a national crisis or emergency happens, people quit watching Christian television. They get glued to the news. They get captivated by that. And out of sight, out of mind, most people's finances go down. And I, I could name right now dozens of very successful, well-known ministries that they suffered a hit during that 9-11 crisis. And it was because people quit tuning into Christian television. So my point is, see, that if you think, well, I've got authority and God is going to supply my need, and so I'm going to take my authority and Satan, I bind you, and I command lack to be gone, and I command blessing to come. And if you are just commanding it and not understanding that God isn't going to give you the money directly, it's people. Men will give into your bosom. He will speak to people. And if you've got a product, you need to pray against the the uh, fear that is being spoken and things like that. You need to pray. I often, you know, uh, have prayed with people and say that people are going to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. They're going to buy this product from somebody. They're going to buy this service from somebody. And so you just pray the favor of God upon you and believe that they're being drawn. You put out advertisement and ask God to use it and bless it. I remember that there was a man in one of my churches and this guy was struggling and uh, didn't have any food to eat. And I was taking him food and I was helping him and stuff. And I was trying to encourage him to believe God. And he says, I just don't understand why God isn't meeting my needs. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said he had blessed the work of your hand. Go do something. Get you a job. Don't just expect the money to fall out of the sky. And he said, well, before I got saved, what I used to do. He was a guy that worked on cars and did body work. And he said, what I do, I had cards and I'd just uh, go walk in town and I'd find a car that had a scratch on it or a ding or a dent, something like that. And I'd look at it and if it was a $200 job, I'd write on my car that, you know, this is worth $200. But today, because I need the money, I'll do this for $100. And I'd write that on the card, put it under the windshield. And he said people would go to call on me and I always could get my work and I could always have money. 
And I said, well, why don't you do that now? And he says, well, oh, I'm trusting God. And I said, well, can't God use you doing that same thing? I said, somehow or another, God's not going to just dump money in you. He's going to get it through people. And if you've got a talent to be able to repair cards, I said, why don't you do, do that again? So he went and got some cards printed up, started doing that. And did you know what? He had plenty of finances. There's some people that see, just think that I'm going to exercise my authority and I'm going to speak and I'm going to command something to happen. And they don't understand that you do not have authority to force uh, people to do things. You have to cooperate. So in my ministry now, when I need money, you know, I go and I present the need to people. Now, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. I don't beg people for money. I don't sit there and try and uh, shame them and tell them, if you don't give, I'm going to go off the television. It's all your fault and things like that. I don't sit there and pressure people. I don't use gimmicks, you know, just uh, so that I won't incriminate myself or somebody else. I'm not going to explain that. But there's a lot of ministers, I believe, that use gimmicks to get people to give. But I will go and tell people that here's what God's told me to do. Here's how much it's going to cost. And I'll let people know and just trust God to touch people's hearts and stuff. I'm, I'm aware that God uses people. And so you've got to understand these things. When you are using your authority, you can't just sit there and make people buy your product. You can't just command that your service is taken advantage of. You can't just speak and command money to fall out of heaven. I actually heard a man on radio one time and he was selling green strings. And he said, for $10, if you'll buy this green string and put it in your wallet, then God will create money. You'll never be without money again. I can guarantee you that is not God. God does not counterfeit United States currency or any other currency. You can't buy a green string and God's going to put money in your wallet. That stuff's wrong. And yet, you know why they do that? Because there's people that buy into it. That's not how it works. And all of this goes back, see, to authority. God gave authority to individuals. He gave you a free will. God is not going to force people to give to you, to buy your product, to buy your service. You've got to do certain things and take into account that those other people that God is going to use to help supply your need, they have a choice in the matter. This week, I've been giving examples of you can't just cast demons out of people against their will. You need to get that person to a place to where, like the demon-possessed person, the uh, Gathering demoniac ran and threw himself at the feet of Jesus. He still, even with having a legion of demons, he had enough control that he could run and throw and himself at the feet of Jesus. I guarantee you that wasn't the demons who did that. That was that man crying out for help, and God took that step of faith and used it to cast those demons out. Amen. Boy, there's a lot of things I've covered. Here in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are some people that have taken these things and have just turned everything into what we've got to do is spiritual warfare. We've got to start binding these demonic powers in heavenly places. And you know what? I've read stories. I've read books about people saying that you have to rent an airplane and get up into the heavenly places so that you can do spiritual warfare. You have to go up into a, a skyscraper up high so that you can bind the demonic powers. You have to go on top of a mountain and all of this stuff. There is zero, zero scriptural precedent for doing something like that. Of course, they didn't have planes back when the Bible was written. They didn't have skyscrapers. But there is zero evidence of people having to climb up into mountains and do these kind of things. There is so much weirdness. I'm talking about the authority of the believer. And, you know, for most evangelicals, they just dismiss that we don't have demonic opposition. They don't even deal with this. And so... Most of them haven't been exposed to this. But once you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, people who are Pentecostal, Spirit-filled, uh, Charismatics, they've been exposed to these things. And I tell you, there are some really, really strange things 
that are being done in the name of the Lord, and they're trying to exercise authority, but they don't understand. Let me put this in context for you. I read verse 12, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, but if you back up into verse 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles here is talking about deception, lies, deceit, Satan's power. Yes, Satan exists. Yes, Satan is destroying people. I tell you, people today that can't decide if they're men or women, that's demonic. That is a demonic deception. People that are changing their gender, people that are just, you know, all of the weirdness that we see today, people trying to defund police, thinking that the less control you have, the less responsibility that people have to do what's right and wrong, the less punishment that's meted out, that somehow or another that's going to make things better. That's demonic. There's a lot of demonic stuff, but it's not... You don't just get up into the heavenlies and start doing this battle. It's the wiles. It's the deception. It's the way people think. Let me put this together with another scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So these verses are talking about spiritual warfare, but notice what it's saying. It casts down thoughts and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The battle is in the mind. Satan isn't forcing people through some superior power to do something. See, this goes back to the very first things that I taught in this series about the believer's authority that Satan got his power and authority from mankind when he deceived us and Adam and Eve yielded themselves and obeyed Satan. They are the ones who made Satan. They're the ones who gave Satan his power, and it's dependent upon us cooperating with him. And the way he gets that is through the wiles of the devil, through imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So, yes, there's spiritual warfare, but it's not really being done out there in the heavenlies. It's right between your ears. It's wrong thinking is how Satan gains access to you. And so when you go to deal with demonic powers that are in other people, whether it's, uh, you know, demon possession, influence, I'm not going to get into this thing about, you know, whether you're possessed, oppressed, depressed, people try and split hairs and, and make differentiation in that. In the Bible, if you go into the Greek, it doesn't really use the word possessed. It just says that you are demonized is what it literally says in the Greek. And there's varying degrees of that. You could just be under the influence of a demon. You could literally be controlled and dominated by a demon. I'm not going to get into all of that, but nonetheless, we are dealing with demonic stuff that comes against us individually and also when we're dealing with other people. I can guarantee you a lot of the immorality that is being pushed down our throats today is pure demonic. When you see transgender men dressing in women's lingerie and doing, I mean, sexual acts, imitating the sexual act in front of kindergarten, first grade, that's demonic. And I know that this offends a lot of people. And I don't know what to say other than the fact that, that what I'm telling you is the truth. It is demonic. Man, the, the strip shows that people go to, the prostitution, the, the pedophilia that's being done, bestiality that's being done, the way that people are trafficked, this is demonic. It is not just people exercising their freedom and stuff and their liberty. No, it is demonic at its core. And you can disagree with me, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you that this stuff is demonic. And when you're dealing with that, you don't just go in and start binding demonic powers. 
You know, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm getting close to being out of time today, but I've got some things that I want to say about this. I'm going to have to reserve for tomorrow's program, but it's, there are a lot of people who recognize some of the things we're dealing with in our society are just pure demonic at its core. But the way they're trying to deal with it is they get people together and they just pray and they bind these demonic powers, but they wouldn't dare stand up and speak the truth. They wouldn't dare go vote. They wouldn't dare take a stand on what the Bible says about morality. They're just going to get in their prayer closet and they're going to pray. I'm going to say something here that will infuriate some people. I, I, you know, Galatians 4, 16 says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? My purpose isn't to upset or to make anybody mad, but I'm just trying to get the truth out that there are people who are substituting prayer for actions. And they wouldn't dare say anything that might get them criticized or something. They wouldn't dare act, but they'll get and they'll pray and they'll bind and do spiritual warfare. It says in James chapter 2, verse 20, that faith without works is dead. And it was saying in context, you believe that there's one God, you're willing to confess that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble, but won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Most people will accept that and understand what I'm saying. I'm going to say that prayer without works is dead. If all you're going to do is get in and do spiritual warfare and you're going to bind the demonic stuff that's working in our society and you're praying for revival and an awakening and a change, but you wouldn't dare stand up for the truth. You won't speak the truth. You won't vote. And if you do vote, you don't vote for people who are going to promote godly things. You'll vote for people that are into killing babies even after they've been born. And you're going to do stuff like that, but then you're going to get in your prayer closet and you're going to pray and you're going to bind and you're going to break this spiritual power, I'm telling you that that type of prayer without works is dead. And we've got a lot of people that are into spiritual warfare and they will get people together and they'll pray all night long and they'll get hundreds of people to pray and to bind and loose, but they won't stand up. They won't stand for truth. They won't speak the truth. They're going to be called a homophobe or a hater or hate speech and you wouldn't dare do anything, but boy, you're going to pray. You'll pray for your neighbor and pray that they'd be born again, but you wouldn't dare witness to them because you might offend them and they might not talk to you again. I'm telling you, that's useless. Prayer without works is dead, the same that faith without works is dead. There is a right and a wrong way to do spiritual warfare. The warfare is between our mind, and the answer to that is to get the truth to people. And I'm going to be talking about that more on our program tomorrow. I've still got a lot more to say. I've got things in this book that I guarantee you, you aren't going to hear very often. I've, the subtitle of this Believer's Authority book is What You Didn't Learn in Church. There are many of you watching this program that you've never heard somebody say the things that I've been saying today. But I tell you, it's true, and it's in here, and it would really help you. So I've got this in English and in Spanish. We've got study guides, DVDs, CDs, and we've also got a USB that will have the audio and video both on here. And I promise you, you need this. You need to go back over it. You also need it so you can share it with other people. So listen to our announcer as he gives you some information, and please call or write today. Learn the power of using your authority and defeating the enemy when you get Andrew's teaching titled, The Believer's Authority. Andrew's complete series, The Believer's Authority, is available in a book, study guide, CD album, or the As Seen on TV DVD album. These products are available in either English or Spanish. Also, we have a DVD album recorded live at a ministry event. Additionally, the entire teaching is now available on a USB flash drive that includes both audio and video. Each of these valuable resources is available when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. We also want to remind you of Andrew's Living Commentary software. The Living Commentary includes more than 50 years of Andrew's Bible study notes and personal encounters with God. 
get Andrew's Living Commentary today for $135. Go to our website at awmc.ca and click on Today's TV Offer under the Store tab to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647 348 2220 to order. I'd like to encourage you to come and join us for our campus days on March the 15th through the 17th. This is where we just let people come and sample what Karis Bible College is all about. You'll hear from all of our instructors, our praise and worship people. You'll get a taste of what Karis life is all about and I think it would really encourage you. It's been some of the best meetings we've ever had as these campus days. So remember, this is March the 15th through the 17th. If you've ever thought about coming to Karis Bible College, you need to be with us and experience campus days. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto. And we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways. But we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Carius Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with the life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Colleen could not understand God's love. Her past mistakes left her sin conscious and ashamed. I was just in my own self-pity, in my own pain, in my own hurt. It was all about well, this was your sin, this was your sin, you did that wrong, you made that mistake, look at that poor choice. Colleen's daughter and son-in-law began to show them the truth that would set Colleen free. I just remember I listened to a teaching and immediately I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you need to send this to your mom. God is good and He loves us because He is love, not because we are lovely. It is because of who we are in the Spirit that we have a relationship with God, not our performance. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He died for you while you were a sinner. He's not going to give up on you now that you're His child. When she began to believe that this love and this grace that she walks in is unearned and undeserved. It's only through the acceptance of the gift of what Christ has done. I really believe that's the beginning of when her complete healing took place.